Hello everyone and welcome back. We are now beginning our lecture number 12. Uh, we're delving even further into Rome. We're going to go through uh, the era known as the Principate, where you have an emperor in charge, and um, talk about all the many and exciting ways that went, well, wrong. So here we go. Alrighty, so where we last left off uh, in our lecture series, we talked about the ascension of Augustus. His name was, um, of course, he took a new name when he was adopted. So he's Gaius Julius Caesar Octavian Augustus. Um, Augustus is an honorific title that the Senate sort of uh, started calling him. And it means sort of lucky, fortunate, uh, noble, all of those things kind of rolled into one. So he's going to rule, as we talked about last time, unopposed from about 31 BC to 14 AD. AD. This is a long stretch. And as we mentioned last time, the sort of net effect of this is that by the time Augustus dies, nobody really remembers how to have a functioning government in Rome without an emperor, without somebody who's running things. Now, during his lifetime, Augustus ties himself into a pretzel going out of his way to keep up the pretense that he's not a king that he's not the equivalent of a king, that he's just doing this service to Rome by occupying all of these various jobs and uh, because nobody else can do such a good job as he. And of course, we'll talk about this in greater detail in our reading discussion, The Deeds of the Divine Augustus this week. Um, but when it comes to the end of his life, uh, this uh, image is challenged by the fact that he tries to set up a succession. Now, it's really, really hard to pretend you're not a king if you are naming a successor to come after you, but he still tries to couch it in kind of traditional Roman terms that, of course, uh, his successor would inherit his estates. Of course, he'd be given honor and privilege when it comes to titles and job offers with the Senate. And so he tries to smooth it over, but he has a bunch of obstacles. First and foremost, he lacks a sort of logical successor. He doesn't have a legitimate son. And um, he, this isn't necessarily an insurmountable obstacle. He doesn't have one, but he does have a daughter, Julia, whom he loves to distraction. Um, he there's, there's all kinds of records about this relationship. And she's a bit of a wild child, but he loves her. And she's married to his best, strongest, most loyal ally, Marcus Agrippa. And she has some children, Gaius and Lucia Caesar, as they come to be known. And they will be adopted by Augustus as his heirs and successors. They're his grandsons. That makes logical sense. And out of recognition of this reality, even though nobody says it out loud that he's actually just an emperor, a king, and, and he's setting up a dynasty, um, out of recognition of this, the Senate even gives them uh, consulships. It even promotes them into the Senate when they're still far, far too young. They're well under the, the age limit uh, and have no obvious military or political um, accomplishments to fall back on. Uh, but it's clear that the way is being paved for one or the other of these kids. Unfortunately, they both die young. And this is tragically really common in the ancient world altogether and Rome as well. Um, child mortality is extremely tragically high, even in the highest circles of um, social life. Their wealth was absolutely no defense. People had no, obviously, no antibiotics, no vaccines, no real uh, resistance to the kind of diseases that strike children down. And for that reason, infant mortality and child mortality was sad. Um, in some estimates, and it's hard to get precise figures, uh, something like um, three in five children uh, would die, will die in ancient Rome, uh, before they reach the age of adulthood. So sometime between birth and, um, you know, when they're old enough to have children of their own. So uh, it, this puts a lot of demands on people. You have to have a lot of kids if you hope to have at least a couple of them reach adulthood to replace your population size. And that's going to be something Rome is going to struggle with constantly. They always need more people, more personnel, and they have to kind of counteract this mortality rate. Uh, not only do you have children die of diseases and accidents and all kinds of things like that, but you also have young adults that uh, die young uh, pretty frequently as well. Uh, women die in childbirth. That's sadly a common outcome. 
uh, in the ancient world right up through um, the 20th century. And men die in warfare in Rome. Again, it's not it's not something what you would necessarily expect to happen to you. But given the fact that they are almost constantly at war, uh, Roman men have a decent chance of dying. It's almost the same rate, um, men dying in battle and women dying in childbirth. It's, it varies a little bit by how busy the wars are, but um, that's more or less how it shakes out. And so Rome is always kind of trying to replace people. And back to the original topic here, Gaius and Lucius Caesar both die. Uh, and they're both dead by 4 AD. And, um, and Augustus is getting a little bit long in the tooth. He's getting up there. He's only going to live till 14 AD, another 10 years. And he's scrambling around looking for somebody p to pick up the mantle, to be his successor. And he lands on Tiberius. Tiberius is an ally politically and socially of um, Augustus. Uh, Livia is, uh, the, is one of Augustus's wives. Uh, she's going to marry... Uh, He's going to have a few wives in his lifetime. And at this point, uh, they're married and Tiberius is therefore uh, Augustus's stepson, though he didn't raise him from a child. But at any rate, um, Tiberius is earmarked. He's going to be adopted by Augustus to be his successor. There's nothing unusual about this in ancient Rome, uh, but it does cause a little bit of a hiccup. Uh, Tiberius isn't universally loved. He doesn't have the kind of charm that Augustus himself had. And in order, even though he does have quite a bit of respect in the army, uh, he's got some definitely capacity. He's a smart and clever guy. He's certainly capable of running uh, the Roman administration, uh, but he's not the sort of natural, obvious choice. And for that reason, um, Augustus feels pressure to make sure that his connection is bolstered, not just by this adult adoption, which he uh, carries out ceremonially, but he bolsters that connection by creating an actual genetic link to this guy. And he does that in exactly the same way that it is traditionally done. He wants Tiberius to marry his daughter, Julia. Well, there's a little bit of a problem with that. Tiberius and Julia are not children to have a marriage arranged for them and have no complications. They're both adults. They've both been married. Julia is a widow. Agrippa is dead at this point. She has several children. And she's enjoying her Roman widowhood. She does not want to marry again. Uh, being a Roman widow gives you a lot of social, uh, economic, and in some ways political freedom as a woman. And she doesn't want to give that up for logical reasons. In addition to that, uh, Tiberius was happily married to a lady named Vipsania. Um, and just to make this a little extra creepy. Uh, Vipsania is Vipsania Agrippina. She's Agrippus's daughter. So it's, uh, yeah, a little awkward. Uh, but he and uh, Vipsania were um, quite fond of each other. And Tiberius does not want to divorce his wife in order to marry Julia, whom he frankly doesn't like that much. But Augustus puts his foot down. He's like, you're going to have to marry Julia if you want to be my heir and successor. And Tiberius says, fine. And he does it with a uh, fairly bad grace. And this only provokes Julia more. She didn't want to marry him in the first place. And then he was rude about it. And so she uh, flips out. She really doesn't want any piece of this. She does it. She agrees to it, uh, kicking and screaming. She marries him but she loathes him and she makes absolutely no effort to hide that fact. And she purposely sets out to embarrass her new husband and her father at every opportunity. Um, so Julia, that's an artist's imagining of her there on the left and the right too. Uh, so Julia goes off on a tear. Now she had a reputation for being a bit of a party girl uh, before this. And some of that is probably undeserved snarking by um, writers, uh, poets and playwrights who are going to like juvenile, who uh, frankly kind of don't like women to begin with and then are uh, trying to use Julia as a scapegoat for all of their uh, political frustrations. Um, but um, she was a bit of a, a free spirit, shall we say, to begin with. Uh, but after her marriage to Tiberius, she absolutely goes on a just an absolute rampage. <laughs> she doesn't kill people. She's not that kind of a rampage. But what she does is sleep with anything in a toga, toga. She just makes no bones about it. Um, and she does it publicly, making no effort to be subtle. Um, 
in the upper circles of Roman society, it, it's not like this was unknown behavior. It was really common um, for these arranged political marriages to be marriages in name only, and people are having affairs on kind of both sides. And this was something that um, social critics snarked about all the time, that, that these rich people were behaving in this decadent way. Um, but Julia is an exception in that she makes no effort to be subtle about it. She just has affair after affair with anybody she feels like, and she hates Tiberius, and she doesn't pretend otherwise. And this deeply embarrasses him. I wouldn't go so far as to say it hurts his feelings, but because he doesn't like her either. But um, it does it 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 looks bad. And it especially looks bad because her father, the emperor, remember him, had passed a whole bunch of laws known as the Lex Julii, which were meant to bolster and reinforce traditional Roman family values. And they actually did things like make adultery illegal for men, not just for women. So again, it really only applied to the fact that if you were married and if you were sleeping with other free Romans, and it didn't really get drilled down far enough to catch people like dallying with their slaves or anything or prostitutes that was accepted. But um, it made, uh, it was strongly discouraged that. And the goal of this, these Lex Julii, was to demonstrate to the people of Rome that rather than being an exemplar of this Roman decadence, Augustus was somebody who was defending traditional values. And traditional values were, you know, faithfulness to your family, that you should marry and have tons of legitimate Roman children so they can carry the next generation forward even stronger than the last. That was the goal. Uh, and in Roman society, uh, you see some differences from the Greeks, perhaps, as we were talking about, uh, we've talked about in the past. Uh, homosexuality, for example. Now, okay, let me backtrack. Romans and Greeks both, and I'll just try to make this quick, but Romans and Greeks both had much less uh, hang up about nudity, sexuality, general uh, sort of bodies and behavior than many modern Europeans and Americans do. They had they didn't have that puritanical attitude about it. Um, but what the Romans where the Romans differ, um, homosexuality was something that was widely acknowledged to be happening. Um, in both the Greek and Roman world and the Hellenistic worlds and all those kind of places. Um, but where the Romans differ a little bit is that they found it, even though they talked about it, it wasn't like it was a secret that this happened, uh, they found it to be socially unacceptable um, and uh, to be discouraged, not on the grounds that there was anything inherently wrong with it or sinful about it or disgusting about it, uh, that's not a view they held, but rather because it was self-indulgent. That um, rather than having sex purely for pleasure, as uh, obviously would be the case if you were having a same-sex affair, um, the Roman was supposed to have heterosexual sex so that they can have as many children as possible. That was the goal. You have a duty to Rome. And so that was the, uh, the attitude overall. So Julia is out just flagrantly disregarding her father's attempt to paint himself and his family as these uh, guardians of traditional morality by having all of these affairs. And it gets so bad eventually that Augustus, despite the fact that he has spoiled her rotten almost her entire life uh, and loves her to distraction, he gets to the point where he's like, you know what, Julia, I, you, you just, your behavior is so embarrassing. You, you have to leave. And so he exiles her and she goes off and she's going to live in exile uh, to the end of her life from Rome. Tiberius remains in Rome and he remains uh, Augustus's heir. Eventually Augustus dies and Tiberius takes over. This doesn't go entirely smoothly. So Tiberius takes over and he, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't have that common touch. He doesn't have the sort of really razor sharp sense of politics that Augustus had. He has kind of a dry and sarcastic sense of humor. It doesn't always go over well when he's talking to members of the Senate. He is not inclined to keep up the pretense to the same degree that Augustus did, that uh, he's not actually just running this show. Uh, so he really cuts a lot of it. And 
makes it hard for the Senate to pretend that they're not just being bossed around by an emperor. Uh, he doesn't treat them with the same respect, and he doesn't go out of his way to make give them plausible deniability about it. And this only gets worse after the death of his adopted son. So remember the whole Julia thing went terribly wrong. So Tiberius adopts a son, Germanicus, and Germanicus has a lot of military success. He's connected by blood to the Julio-Claudians, it's the name that we apply to the, the family of Julius Caesar and elsewhere. And so he's a logical choice. Um, and Tiberius is apparently quite fond of him and has plans that, that Germanicus is going to inherit after his death. Then Germanicus dies and he dies somewhat suddenly. And this happens. People do get sick and die and all kinds of things can happen to you without antibiotics and so forth but he's widely believed to have been poisoned and after that Tiberius who was always kind of sarcastic and sort of difficult kind of a cold guy difficult to get along with goes completely off his rocker he gets paranoid now it you could argue that it's not really paranoia if people are out to get you and if you're the emperor in Rome people are certainly out to get you uh, but he withdraws and this makes it harder and harder for the Senate to pretend he's not an emperor, to pretend he's not a king in essence and everything but name, because he's going to retreat ultimately to his villa at Capri, like on the island. Beautiful place. Lavish, huge palace, in fact. And he's just going to amuse himself with things that he finds entertaining, many of which are kind of twisted um, and cruel. He likes to mess with people. Uh, and then he just sends messengers to tell the Senate what to do. And so it's not like when Augustus was in charge, where the Senate could be like, we've come up with a grand idea. And Augustus could be like, hmm, well, that does sound like a grand idea. But have you considered this other thing? He could sugarcoat it. He could make it he could sort of soft sell uh, the Senate on what he wanted by having these kind of face-to-face, man-to-man kind of encounters. Tiberius just sends edicts about what he wants done. He's not going to pretend. And this is a hard pill for the senators to swallow. Now, they know what the political reality is and has been for 50 years. They know that. But it's hard for them to have to confront it publicly to admit that they, with all of their money and their vast estates, and they still have those, are not as powerful as they their ancestors were. They're not as powerful as people once were who were in their position, that they ultimately serve a king. And remember, Rome has all of that legendary uh, kind of self-identified uh, story about how they're better than other people, better than other soldiers, better than other uh, citizens of other places because they have uh, this government that doesn't have a king and they don't bow to a king and so therefore they're manlier and tougher and cooler than everybody else. So it it's makes for some awkwardness and Tiberius makes that worse by rounding up anybody he thinks might be plotting against him. Now this is one of the, the harder and more difficult parts of setting up this new dynasty. Anybody who serves to benefit from your death could logically be assumed to be plotting that death. And here's the, the kicker. People who are closely related to you have the strongest incentive to plot against you because they are the people who are most likely going to be chosen if you kick it. So um, your family becomes the circle of people who are most threatening to you. And this reality really does something to people. It messes with their heads. They're surrounded by people all the time. And the closer their relationship is, their family relationships, the more dangerous those people are. But even the people who are not their close relations are always lying to them. They're always flattering and trying to manipulate the person who's making all of these decisions and has all of this power. It's really, really hard and difficult. And if you grow up like that, if you are a child in that environment and people expect that you're going to be the next emperor, this is so just devastatingly mind melting that almost universally what happens is that that child will grow up to be quite unhinged. Uh, but Tiberius does a pretty good job of being unhinged, even though he uh, ascends to the throne as an adult. 
Uh, but nevertheless, he retreats to Capri. He gets crazier and crazier. He has his entertainments. And part of his entertainment came from psychologically tormenting this kid. Caligula is what his nickname was. This is Germanicus's son. And Germanicus, remember, he was the one who was Tiberius wanted to come after him and he possibly gets poisoned. And this was his young son. And he gets this name Caligula. It's a nickname. Um, it means little boots or bootykins, as um, a Mary Beard once translated it. Um, and he gets this nickname because he, as a, a young, young boy, was went out on campaign with his father as almost like a mascot. His father was in command of the Legion. And, and so he brings his little boy with him. And the little boy had an outfit that was a little miniature version of the Roman soldiers, like outfit and armor, including the little Caligae, which are the Roman soldiers' boots. And the soldiers found this so so charming and they found it so cute this little mini mini kid who is um you know a mini soldier that they called him little boots and that was the nickname that stuck to him and he would have been absolutely mortified to find out that in history class thousands of years later we talk about him and the name we use is Caligula uh, which was his little bootykins nickname because in his life as an adult to his face nobody ever called him that uh, they called him Germanicus but at any rate he was the one who was now earmarked to come after um, Tiberius. And Tiberius was unbelievably cruel to him. Uh, his dad is dead. His mother and sister are going to be kind of used as hostages for Caligula's kind of good behavior to make sure that nobody uses him politically as a tool to assassinate Tiberius and replace him with this Caligula kid. And his treatment of Caligula's mother and sister is so harsh and so bad that ultimately they die kind of in prison. Um, kind of off in the corner. Uh, Caligula is constantly being threatened by his uncle all the time. It's kind of thing. He's, um, no, he's, yeah, basically struggling and, and it's difficult for him. And it uh, twists his mental processes quite a bit as he gets to adulthood. But after some decades of this, he does inherit. Uh, so 37 AD, Caligula takes over. And he has some plans for the Roman Empire. He doesn't have that really strong, uh, kind of sour, withdrawn personality that uh, Tiberius had. What he has is somewhat worse. He's unhinged. And although some of what he does is completely rational and completely reasonable, he's not clinically mentally ill in the way that we would think probably. Um, he engages in a bunch of popular building projects. He passes legislative reform. He has a very strong following in the military who are quite loyal to him. And if you were a common person, Caligula no doubt seemed like a pretty good emperor. He was rational. He was relatively understanding to the common person. He went out of his way not to impose heavy taxes. And that was a little bit of a trick because Caligula is spending money he doesn't exactly have. Those huge resources, those huge reserves of gold that came in from the, the looting of Egypt uh, when Augustus left after his Civil War victory are gone now. And so in order to pay for lavish palaces and building projects and legislative reforms and the massive pleasure barge, which we had like basically a city on it that uh, Caligula liked to uh, paddle around in, um, to pay for all of that, he has to come up with money. And he doesn't want to raise taxes on ordinary people because that, of course, would be unpopular and, and um, you know, difficult for them to live with. He does, however, want to cut into the influence and power and independence of that senatorial class, those super rich people who are technically supposed to be kind of running the show, but actually aren't and nobody believes that anymore. So Caligula, this is where you say he's a little bit unhinged. Caligula stops any pretense at all. If Tiberius made it crystal clear by sending envoys that just told the Senate what to do, that he was running things, Caligula goes that step further. He doesn't just tell the Senate what to do. He absolutely torments them with it. He rubs their face and it is the, the kindest way you could possibly put it. He makes comments that are twisted later, like his famous comment where he says that his horse would be a better senator than uh, most of the people he has to deal with. He doesn't actually make his horse a senator. It's a myth later. But at any rate, what he does do is that he will um, 
basically ha- create scenes where he will um, show up cross-dressed to some kind of important formal affair. Not because this is an honest expression of how he feels about things or what he wants to do, but because it puts everybody there in this really awkward position because there he is he's the emperor he dress in like a wig and he's got a dress on and he'll just show up and be like hi and everyone is just in this super awkward position where they can't say anything because he's the emperor and he has all this power that feeling is what he's after he loves to confront people with the fact that he can do whatever he wants to them in fact and this is obviously a paraphrase he's famous for sitting in meetings where people are trying to brief him and what's supposed to be going on and what he's supposed to be doing. And he'd kind of half listen and then all of a sudden break out laughing. And so the senators are all sitting there. Now, these are all powerful, rich dudes who have thousands of people who answer to them. Uh, will look over and be like, uh, yeah, what's, what's so amusing? And he's like, I just thought of the funniest thing. And they're like, oh, and he says, I could have you all killed. Isn't that funny? And of course, now they're in, they have to sit there and be like, yes, how funny. Yay, Caligula. Well, this is all pretty terrible. And the senators are mad about it. And they're really upset. And so the image we have of him that has come down to us historically is really, really negative, generally speaking. Uh, when you say Caligula's name, people picture this really twisted monster of a horrible tyrant emperor. And I'm not saying he didn't earn that picture. Uh, to some extent, but you should, just for perspective's sake, realize that the people he loved to torment were the people who wrote the history. They're people who uh, uh, are going to be powerful. He didn't mess with the common guy, but he did make a terrible mistake in uh, really causing the Senate to be afraid because not only did he say these rude things, he might have gotten away with saying the rude things and spending all the money and all that whatnot, but He decides to raise money because he needs it, uh, not by raising taxes, but by um, accusing a very wealthy senator of treason, of plotting against him. He accuses him, convicts him, because he's the emperor and he can just do that, convicts him of treason, and if you're guilty of treason in the Roman Empire, all of your estates and cash money are forfeit to the state. Dun, dun, dun. So he seizes his estates, and it's a huge amount of money. There is a massive division between the rich and the poor in ancient Rome. There's huge wealth disparity, and so uh, the rich are unimaginably rich they are any one of the the top probably 20 or 30 uh richest senators uh probably have in their personal treasury in their personal holdings more money than is in the state treasury of rome at any given time um they're really rich so he grabs up a bunch of uh money as a result of this and uses it to pay for building projects and things like that Well, this is the bridge too far. The Senate is not going to tolerate this because it's one thing to say a lot of snarky comments. It's another thing to be kind of, uh, you know, just rude and making them feel bad about themselves. But now that he's stepped over into uh, inventing charges of treason so that he can seize people as as states, nobody feels safe because any of them who are rich and powerful could be next. And rich and powerful people don't sit quietly when their lives are threatened generally speaking. They're going to take action. They're going to do something. And they shouldn't be discounted. They may no longer be uh, functional in terms of running the government on their own anymore. That's not really a possibility just because of the demands of the army and the hugeness of the empire. But nevertheless, they are not to be discounted. They are dangerous. And you can see that play out with what happens to Caligula. The Praetorian Guard makes an executive decision that his behavior is so erratic, that he's so dangerous, that if they let him go unchecked, there's going to be civil war. These senators are already retreating to their estates, uh, drumming up their supporters, thinking to put together basically militias uh, to challenge the emperor. And so the Praetorian Guard, the captain of the Praetorian Guard, who's in in charge of being the bodyguard of the emperor, among other things, uh, decides that he's got to go that he can't be left in charge of the government because he's too dangerous. So they kill him. And then they go running through the palace to find his successor. 
Now, the next sort of male relative in line is a guy named Claudius. He's Caligula's uncle, technically. Um, and he'd, of course, been passed over for succession. He'd never been considered seriously uh, by Tiberius. Um, but he's still alive and he's hanging out there. And the reason he was still alive, because Caligula had a lot of his uh, extended family killed off. The reason he's still alive is, and this reads just like a story out of Livy, because he had a speech impediment, he had a stammer, it was fairly bad, and um, instead of having him murdered, Caligula decided to keep him around so that he could mock him. So it's a little like the Brutus story, I, I don't know, but at any rate, uh, Claudius is discovered by the Praetorian Guard hiding in the palace, because once he hears that the emperor has been killed, he figures, uh-oh, I'm related to that guy, I'm probably next. And the Praetorian Guard pulls back the curtain that is his hiding place, and immediately uh, they kneel down, hail Caesar, it's you, they've chosen him to be the next Caesar. Now this is a watershed moment. The Praetorian Guard is essentially acting on behalf of the army. And in this way, they've made a jump that the Roman Empire is never going to go back from entirely. The army has decided that they can make and break emperors. They've gotten rid of Caligula and replaced them with Claudius because that's what they decided was in the interests of Rome. Now the power has shifted yet again. It shifted once before when we talked about Sulla using the army to take over the government of Rome, that cult of personality thing. Now we're talking about how the army is basically acting on its own to make and break emperors. So here's the deal with Claudius. Now it's almost an anticlimax. It turns out that his stammer is not nearly the obstacle that people thought it might be. In fact, now that people aren't trying to murder him every second or thinking about murdering or threatening to murder him every second, it's not even really all that bad. And he is essentially a practical person who is reasonable and polite and does quite a good job. He's going to rule for some years, uh, about 13, and he's going to have quite a bit of success at it, and people are reasonably satisfied with his rule. He dies, however, and this gets back to the whole dynasty thing. He dies mysteriously in 54 AD. He may have been poisoned, possibly by his wife, Agrippina the Younger. She's a member of that same family. She's not the daughter of Agrippa uh, at this point, but she's part of the same family. Um, and she had moved her son, so Claudius's stepson, who'd been adopted as his heir, uh, into the palace with him. And uh, then the next thing you know, Claudius bleh, dies. There's all these rumors that Agrippina poisoned him so that her son Nero can take over. Now... There's a reason I'm kind of laboring this point and going through each of these emperors. Uh, we're doing it fast, but I'm still taking quite a bit of time here to, to drill down to quite a lot of detail because they demonstrate a broader principle of what's going on in the Roman government. This succession crisis, this personality crisis where you have one horrible emperor after another meeting a grisly end uh, really characterizes this whole time period after Augustus's death. His successors, the Julio-Claudians, are ridiculously uh, challenged, shall we say. They're attempting to set up a new relationship. They're attempting to set up this kind of permanent dynasty ruling Rome, and they only partially succeed at that. Uh, and Nero is really going to be the end of this branch of the family. He's going to be the end of the dynasty. Uh, and he is completely unhinged. He demonstrates a principle that Rome is going to struggle with. His uh, stepfather um, was the emperor. He was named heir. And he is going to grow up believing he will be emperor. And then he's going to be named emperor when he's still quite young. And the impact that this has on him psychologically is very similar to what we found with Caligula. He goes nuts. And again, I'm not saying there's necessarily anything clinically wrong with him, but he is deeply uh, paranoid and he is odd in his choices. He's also deeply suspicious of his family. 
He has his mother Agrippina executed uh, in 65 AD. His wife Poppea dies. Uh, she was pregnant at the time. There were rumors that he killed her, specifically by uh, kicking her to death. Nobody's really clear on whether that happened. It possibly didn't. Probably didn't. I don't know. But other members of his family he has rounded up and executed his former tutor he has rounded up and executed he has anybody executed who seems to be bothering him or uh seems to have offended him in any way he's really uh just he's acting like a, a despot somebody who's just does what he wants to do and that extends to his attitude toward governance which is uh poor he doesn't really care about running Rome. Caligula at least had like building projects in mind and, and uh, took care of the army. Nero doesn't even do that because he doesn't care. He doesn't really want to be emperor in the sense that he has to do the work of being emperor. He just wants to live in a palace and have parties and enjoy himself. Uh, and so he gets this reputation. This is not a secret that is well kept. Everybody knows this about Nero, that he's unhinged. He's violent. He's dangerous. Uh, he may have you executed at the weakest pretense and he also imagines that his true calling was as an artist rather than as uh, you know an actual boring old governmental administrator like he's actually being called upon to do so rather than doing the job of overseeing the empire and what it should be you know handled instead he does things like writes plays and then performs in them and then forces the senate to attend him performing in his play he composes music uh, the legend of nero and this has been in the news a lot lately is that he fiddled he played the fiddle while the great fire of rome broke out uh, that was 64 a.d um and Nero almost certainly had nothing to do with the great fire of Rome breaking out. He didn't set the fire. That rumor goes around almost immediately in Rome, however, that he did set the fire, in part because once the fire was put out, and it was a horrible, devastating thing, uh, it, it destroys uh, between a quarter and a third of the city of Rome, which was huge at this point, but a million residents. Uh, it kills and displaces thousands and thousands of people if not a million, not quite a million, couldn't be, but it, it kills and displaces tons of people, hugely devastating. And uh, when it was over, Nero begins a rebuilding project, but a big part of what he builds in this newly cleared area is a fabulous palace for himself. So the rumor goes around pretty quickly that he actually set the fire. It's not necessarily important that he did this. He almost certainly did not, as I mentioned. But it is important for you to note that people believed he might have. This was plausible. And uh, all these accounts circulated as well that while the fire was burning on the horizon, he and his safe palace, you know, far away from where the fire was, sang songs and played music. And he, of course, did not play a fiddle because it hadn't been invented yet. But he may have played a lyre, as you see pictured here, or some other zither or something, something else. But at any rate, he was widely believed to be capable of setting his own city on fire so that he could clear a spot for his fabulous new palace. Now, as I mentioned, Nero absolutely loved the fine life. And if you were in the upper classes in Rome at this point, that life was pretty good. As we mentioned way back when we talked about Augustus, this was the era of the Pax Romana. It doesn't mean it's a safe or peaceful time to live, even for the upper classes, especially for the upper classes who are embroiled in politics. But there were a lot of creature comforts to be had. There was no real pressing danger from outside the empire. There was constant war on the borders, but nothing where they were worried about um, invaders. And there wasn't any major civil war during this time period. And the way that uh, upper class people lived was really quite luxurious. It was, uh, they lived in villas, typically, this was the standard. Um, and we have beautiful preserved remains of these villas uh, from the cities of uh, Herculaneum and Pompeii. From the first century AD, uh, there was a big volcanic eruption, Vesuvius went off in uh, 79. And the, the cities of Herculaneum and Pompeii were substantially preserved under the layer of ash uh, as a result of that volcanic explosion, as well as some of the, you know, the bodies of people as well. So we have this like snapshot into Roman life and what it looked like. And the Roman villa, and this was with Pompeii and Herculaneum both, but Pompeii especially was like a vacation town. Um, it was... Uh, 
a place that you'd left Rome in the summertime to go and hang out because the weather was better and everybody enjoyed it and it had lots of luxurious uh, appointments. So it's like other vacation towns or cities. It has lots of restaurants. It has lots of, um, it has lots of like brothels. It has lots of kind of amenities that are maybe it's not exactly a representation of what the average uh, town looked like. Uh, but the villas of the wealthy that were there were lavish and fantastically just cool. Um, they would be kind of built around central courtyard so that you'd have good airflow. The windows facing the street would be very high and relatively small. You didn't have a lot on the facade. But inside, there would be bathing pools um, in open courtyards. There'd be uh, gardens in the open courtyards. Around the outside perimeter of the house would be kitchen gardens where vegetables would be grown and chickens would be kept and perhaps a pig, that kind of thing. Servants' quarters. There would be multiple servants that served to maintain and clean the house. And the whole place would be heated with something called hypocost heating. Now, the, you can see the actual archaeological remnants of what hypocost heating looks like on that picture in the right. Now, this, better than anything else, gives you some summary of just how well the upper class lived in Rome. The water for these villas would be piped in uh, from the aqueduct diverted usually illegally but they would be piped in clean water that was shipped from outside town and it would be uh, flushed away by plumbing there was indoor plumbing inside these upper class roman houses uh, it was not as advanced as uh, perhaps modern plumbing is but it is a good way that you don't have to go all the way outside the lug water all in and out all the time uh, water would piped in and piped out so they had indoor plumbing and with the hypocost heating, they had indoor heated plumbing. The way this system works is that you can see it on the picture on the left. You see how there's a cutaway, you've got the pool. And then if you continue looking down, you see that kind of like swirly lines. And then there's a little like box outside the walls instead of a cutaway. The wall has been cut there uh, to show you what's underneath. The way it works is that there's kind of a furnace that is an open fire it's usually wood fire charcoal on the outside and it would be tended by a servant who would keep the fire burning when they had the hypocost on and this fire would heat up air that would circulate under the floor in the roman villa and it would heat up any pipes or whatever else was under there as well and this warm air would then heat the house by heating the floor as a result, inside a Roman villa, they didn't, they could have nice warm houses with nice warm floors to walk on without ever having to worry about smoky, nasty fireplaces or having to have kind of open each of their bedrooms or whatever, having to have an opening to outside a chimney that would make things cold. Instead, they had this beautiful indoor heated plumbing because you could heat water that was being moved uh, into the house as well this way. Uh, and every possible amenity that you could possibly imagine or want was provided for uh, if you were wealthy. You had a great, very comfortable life. And they were very fond of lavish decoration. Inside these houses, um, these villa rooms, Romans were particularly fond, not only of lavishly decorating their spaces, but they were very fond of something called the trompe l'oeil, where you fool the eye. It's a French term, artistic term. They were very fond of painting paintings that tried to recreate an illusion of reality. So uh, in Livia's villa, you can see the painting there on the right. You can see a lavish and beautiful gardenscape that was painted on the inside of a dining room. So you went into the dining room and it looked like you were surrounded by all of this nature uh, and an interior room that didn't have a window for instance like the villa of the Farnesina uh, on the uh, left side you can see what they like to do very often was paint windows so you have paintings and there's paintings of statues which is one form of trompe l'oeil and then you have this painting of a window that isn't actually a window it's just a painting it imagines an outside scene uh, Romans do this kind of thing all the time. They're very, very fond of this kind of optical illusion and visual puns. And so they lavishly decorate their houses to reflect this taste. 
Um, this is one of the most famous of the visual puns. This is Cave Cana Mosaic. And it's a, there's a reference to this, maybe not this specific one, but there's a reference to this phenomenon. It's not exclusive to this particular mosaic. Apparently a bunch of these exist. Um, this is the Cave Cana. And what that says in Latin underneath the dog's feet there is beware of dog. And it's a picture of a dog. And this is meant to be a joke. <laughs> the Romans love puns. Uh, you may love puns, you may not love puns, but if you don't love puns, you won't love Latin poetry, I can tell you that. Uh, Latin is, this is just a digression, bear with me here. Latin is the kind of language, because it's fully declined, uh, which means that the nouns change form depending on what part of speech they are, it's very difficult to tell the kind of joke that we tell in English, where you have like a setup and a punchline, it doesn't work that well in Latin because you, there's too much of the mystery is taken away by knowing what part of speech each word is. So you can't do the same kind of surprise ending easily to a sentence or a story. And so for that reason, it's hard to tell that kind of a joke. And instead, what the Romans do is pun. And they have a lot of homophones in, uh, wrote in Latin and so it's really easy to do this and they make puns and puns and puns and puns and that's just kind of what they do and they like visual puns as well so this of course is the joke cave cana we'll talk about it when we talk about the reading in more detail all right so Mo Roman mosaic is one of the chief forms that we find of Roman artistic work they put it all over their floors all over their walls uh, again this is Herculaneum one of those cities that was set and preserved in time in the first century BC, uh, I'm sorry, that shouldn't say BC, that should say AD. That's a mistake. Oh, no. Um, so it's the first century AD. Um, there it is. You can see this beautiful um, mosaic that's, uh, you can see it on the wall on the far uh, right there. You can, this is the detail of that mosaic. So in this, you get glimpses of Roman artistic references, styles, you get images of gods and goddesses, you get images of historical figures, you get visual puns, you get images of animals and, and ocean life and, and all kinds of thrilling things. And the overall picture that you get when you look at the, the city and the, the towns of Herculaneum and Pompeii is of a life that is very extremely comfortable if you're in this upper class. It also gives us glimpses into the life of what it was like for people who lived that weren't in this highest upper class. Um, so images of slave quarters, uh, brothels where uh, prostitutes lived, all of that is uncoverable as well. And what we see is that there is a big class difference. There's a big difference in the quality of life between the classes. Rich Romans lived high on the hog. Poor Romans scraped by. Now I have one more thing to show you and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, more of the, the tension politically that's going on here. Okay, this is just really kind of a side note, um, but recently there's been some work done uh, to try to reconstruct what Roman statuary might originally have looked like. And this is something I want to emphasize because I'm about to show you, and I have been showing you lots of like marble busts, marble, uh, you know, basically statues depicting various emperors and figures. And they, they all have kind of a sameness about them because they're all white because they're marble and they all have this kind of like blank eyed sort of expression. I mean, their faces are incredibly vivid. This is one of the things that's great about Roman statuary in that they're very, very detailed and Roman sculptors do not flinch away at all from depicting uh, physical flaws and uniqueness. These faces aren't made uniform. Uh, there really seems to have been an effort to depict people the way that they looked and, you know, so to make them recognizable. And that went everything down to, you know, forehead wrinkles, to eye bags, to the, sh the eye, if you had an odd shaped mouth or nose, or if you were fat or bald or whatever, that seems to be carried out pretty faithfully in statues, even statues of emperors who could, of course, order the most flattering image of themselves that they wanted. Um, it nevertheless seem to have depicted themselves in ways that capture what they actually looked like. And this is so much the case that current artists have recently been using these statues and colorizing them and creating kind of photorealistic images of what it might have looked like 
um, what the emperor might have looked like, and to give you some sense of what the statues themselves might have looked like. Now, they wouldn't be as finely painted and finely detailed, probably, as the ones you see on the right there, or even the left. Because when you paint a statue, it doesn't it, it's hard to make it look quite realistic and it's hard for us to know exactly how beautifully or painted these things might have been uh, of course because the paint itself doesn't survive it's broken down it's fallen off it's been scrubbed off by some uh, well-meaning but poorly informed archaeologists in some cases and so we don't really know what the original looked like but we do know from traces of evidence that they were painted and they were painted to look as realistic as possible, as much like the person as they could. And so uh, if you can imagine how different that would be if you saw all those statues put up around Rome and instead of being plain and white, they were painted in bright and sort of lifelike colors. Uh, it really makes it look like that emperor is just sort of alive and staring at you. It also counteracts that kind of blank eyed look that you get in a lot of the statues where it looks like their eyes are weird because they're just flat and that's because they would have been painted and so anyway so at any rate here we have some artist recreation just as a side note uh there's a reconstruction that's an actual roman bust of caracalla he's one of the severan emperors we'll get to him in just a bit um born in north africa and uh, there you have an artist's interpretation of what that would look like painted and then of course on the right we have yet another uh, a, an artist by the name of daniel voschart uh took some uh portraits some marble portraits of emperors and he kind of half and half them with a kind of photorealistic imagining use computer software to help him do that of what that person might have looked like in life and he used some ancient descriptions of what their coloring was and just kind of made a guess as to what uh the sort of details of like their hair color and stuff like that might be okay and i just want to make a point before we move on there's often a debate because when romans describe uh important historical figures when they describe people who are alive during the time they're being described they very very seldom uh describe them in the kind of detail that would make you uh that would help you to know precisely what their hair color and eye color and skin color looked like um it's just not easy to recover you can sort of make a guess uh based on uh kind of lineages and families and whatnot and once in a while you get people who are described as being blonde or having uh pale eyes or um and you know being dark or whatnot but generally speaking uh, they don't really describe it race in the way that we think of it in the modern world really did not exist in the ancient world they didn't think about it that way and so they might describe uh, a physical attribute that was in some way remarkable like Sulla was described as blonde and that was very unusual and so uh, everybody sort of talked about it when they described him uh, but generally speaking they just kind of don't and so you have to be very careful as a modern person kind of recreating in your head what people might have looked like because you have to remember that uh, the ancient sources don't necessarily tell us that okay so but that being said their statues are so lifelike you can do this half half thing and it looks i mean it's the same level of detail as there in the marble okay so what was life like for people who weren't super rich well most of them lived if you were in the city of rome itself in multi-story apartment buildings uh known as insulae um, and th that just means island. And so they would live on several stories. This one is just a couple that are preserved here, uh, the remnants of it. But they would be five and six stories high sometimes, and they'd be built of brick for the most part. And remember, everyone is using open flame for light and heat and cooking. And if you lived on the upper floors of one of these insulae, that was very dangerous. I mean, oil lamps for light are one thing, but having a cooking fire, this was something that was strongly discouraged or outright forbidden in many places. And so a great numbers of people who were in the lower classes who lived in these walk-ups, these high uh, buildings didn't cook in their homes at all they ate street food and they went to the baker and bought bread uh, they'd be given a ration every roman citizen who lived in the city was given a ration of grain usually not in the form of grain there was this whole process uh, where basically they would take their grain ration to the baker the baker would give them a loaf of bread in exchange um, and uh, that's how it worked um, because of course they, if they don't have an oven and very few people do, and they don't have, 
a, a cook a cooking situation it's very difficult for an ordinary roman to turn grain into food you have to mill it somehow or you have to cook it into porridge and that, that's all just very difficult so uh, it made much more sense to have professional bakers which existed in these huge workshops um, that would uh, take the grain and turn it into bread for people to eat in addition to that, there were street vendors selling virtually every kind of food you could possibly imagine, and people did buy that and use it for their main sustenance. Um, oil, olive oil was the chief uh, source of light. Um, lamps in that way there would be fires there was some wood fire situation going but generally speaking um it was fairly moderate and minimal okay so uh and another amenity that the romans did have to enjoy and this was something that anybody all classes were kind of welcome to partake in were public baths and public baths would sometimes have a nominal fee uh, but generally were free for people to use but then had extra services you could buy so you could uh, hire someone to do a massage or to shave or to you know get, get a haircut down in the bath uh, and these public baths were gathering places for people of all levels of or almost all the emperor wouldn't be down there but they were almost all levels of society there were places where you could go and do business you could meet people both men and women used the public baths. It was uh, kind of a really open public service for everybody. What this actually did in terms of hygiene and cleanliness, I don't generally like to think too hard about because I'm sure, I'm sure they were filthy in any kind of real evaluation of the thing in terms of bacteria and whatnot. They weren't chlorinated. Uh, however, this image here is of the Roman bath as it is archaeologically preserved. It was a real Roman bath uh, in England. It had it's since then been used for many generations and it had a big Victorian presence as well. There's a hot spring, a natural hot spring in Bath, England. And so it was converted into a Roman bath. And that color, that water is not gross or like algae filled or anything. It's the minerals in the water just refract. It's got some copper or whatever that refracts the light in that way. So it's got this really unnerving green color, but it's not actually smelly or dirty or anything. If you go there, it's pretty cool. Okay, so at any rate, public baths exist aqueducts and fountains bring clean water in for everybody's usage uh, sewers take dirty water away all of these things are kind of oh and there are public toilets too i don't think i have a picture of the public toilets oh that's a shame anyway uh there are public toilets as well <laughs> that are kind of around the city so that there's every effort kind of to, to make the city as clean as it can be even with all of that uh in the summertime it stinks it's hot, there's mosquitoes, the place is miserable to live in, and the poor kind of suffer through it while the rich retreat to those super fancy villas in places like Pompeii. All right, now, back to the politics. Nero, I mentioned, was completely unhinged. He uh, is going to be playing his music while Rome burns down, uh, but it was such a terrible, devastating event. People were so furious. They wanted somebody to blame. They were blaming the emperor. They thought he had something to do with it, or at least hadn't done enough to prevent it. And so he decides, and this is the first official recognition of a new group of people. It may not be the first time emperors were aware of them, but this is the first time they officially recognized them, legally speaking, of a group of people known as Christians. Now, in 68 AD... Uh, Roman officials who leave records that we have to look at considered Christians to be a weird offshoot of Judaism. And Judaism was something that they understood and had been, you know, really wrestling with a bit since Pompey, go back to the first triumvirate, conquest of the province of Judea back since then. And Judea had been a little bit of a troublesome province for them since. We'll get, we'll expand on that in just a moment. Uh, there had been some revolts and some issues, and there had been some administrative talk over the years intervening about whether uh, Jews should be given a kind of special set of privileges. Because Judaism is unique, very unusual in Mediterranean ancient religions in that it is monotheist. And not only monotheist, meaning that they have just one God, but it strictly prohibits its followers from venerating other gods besides the one that they worship. And this was a big problem for Rome because they were polytheists and not only polytheists, but they were aggressively inclusive polytheists. Anytime that they conquered a new place, 
that place's gods were incorporated into the Roman pantheon. Uh, images of them would be brought back to Rome and put up in a little temple, a little shrine to them. And those gods would be considered the gods of Rome as well. And everybody in their sort of Roman public worship was expected to venerate the gods, honor them, give them sacrifices, participate in this kind of public uh, worship, just as you found everywhere else in the ancient Mediterranean. And so it was troubling to emperors and it was troubling to the leaders of Rome that this whole population of people refused to do that. It seemed like uh, to many Roman emperors that by refusing to honor Rome's, Rome's gods as other gods, uh, Jupiter and Hera and all of those, um, uh, that um, Juno, I'm sorry, Hera would be the Greek version, uh, but uh, by refusing to honor those gods, that they were being... Um, intolerant and worse than being intolerant it seemed like an act of political defiance that they were refusing to acknowledge rome's um, authority over them and refusing to kind of play along and be good kind of subjects as it were and so this causes some tension and the way that rome had more or less dealt with it is to have an uneasy truce they'd come to the decision that it was probably best not to push it too hard that sure it it, it's a little abrasive, especially if they won't uh, make the kinds of oaths where they, you know, swear to venerate the genius of the emperor or something like that. But at the same time, at least Jewish people were following most mayorum, the ways of their ancestors, and you have to respect that. And so the general official administrative position at the time that Nero is emperor is to just leave them alone. It's like, fine, just let them have their exception. Just don't worry about it too much. But Christians, Christians were a different thing. Christians were perceived by Nero and others like him as a weird offshoot as this new novel group of people where they were made up of Jews who had broken away. And that's largely accurate. Um, Christian Christianity spreads in the first century, largely through Jewish communities. Uh, that's where you tend to find Christians. There are people who were uh, Jewish originally before they converted or started following Christianity. And so it makes logical sense that the Romans perceive it this way. And the Romans also object to it because it's it's novel. It's, these are not people following the ways of their ancestors. They've broken with the ways of their ancestors by deciding that, um, you know, they're going to follow this Christ figure. But at the same time, this really offends Romans. They're still monotheist they still refuse to acknowledge the other gods of rome and so this made them doubly suspicious and so without the sort of ways the ancestor justification uh nero and others are like well they've got no justification at all you can't just make up religions first of all second of all you can't uh you can't just refuse to acknowledge the other gods you'll anger the gods and endanger us all we don't like that so he figures there's this rumor about this new weird group of Jewish breakaways and uh, I need a scapegoat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to accuse the Christians of having started the Great Fire of Rome. I want to emphasize there's no evidence they did so. There's no evidence Nero did so. There's no evidence that any one particular person did so at all. It was likely just an accident and a fire hazard. Uh, the whole city was a fire hazard. Uh, but regardless, Nero is like, they definitely caused it. And so he orders officially all Christians in Rome to be rounded up, arrested, and executed for having caused this terrible fire. So... They're going to be executed publicly. This is the first official recognition of Christianity by Romans. Then, things don't exactly pick up for Nero. They don't improve. They don't get better. There's all this whispering. He's a terrible emperor. And there's a revolt. It's relatively minor in 68 AD. And Nero panics. They're convinced they're coming for him and that he's going to end up dead. So he orders his slave to kill him to sort of save himself the difficulty of falling on his own sword. I don't know. But he dies. And then there's a period of disorder. There's no Julio Claudian to take over. And so there's this big debate. Who's going to rule Rome next? Okay, so what happens is that you have the emergence of a group known as the military emperors. They're exactly what they sound like. These are people who have no genetic connection to Julius Caesar or to Augustus, but they are favored by the army. They're people who are military commanders 
risen through the ranks and have uh, the support of a large enough section of the army that they managed to get themselves proclaimed emperor. The first of these is a guy named Vespasian. He's a stern sort of figure. And he was welcomed broadly by the population because he's able to deliver on what they want. Namely, he restores stability. There had been a period of chaos and civil war. Everybody hates that. It's awful to live through. He fixes that. He suppresses provincial rebellions. And this is where I, I just alluded to a second ago. There was a rebellion in the province of Judea in 70 AD. Vespasian is going to go marching on in there with his sons, Titus and Domitian. We'll show them in the next picture. And uh, he's going to suppress this rebellion violently. This was known as the Third Jewish Revolt. And that should already kind of be tripping your antenna, knowing what you know about the Romans. The Third Jewish Revolt. <sighs> When you rebel against a large territorial empire, the empire tends to come down on you like a ton of bricks to discourage that in the future. This is the third time there's been a major rebellion in Judea, and what happens is the ton of bricks is going to land on them. The city of Jerusalem in particular is hit enormously hard. The second temple of David, the one that was uh, built by the Persians, um, is, or with the help of the Persians, I should say, is destroyed, all but a single wall of it. Um, the treasures are looted and dragged back to Rome, and the population of Jerusalem and anybody who fought in this rebellion is going to go through that thing that Rome does, where they capture women and children, where they disperse um, uh, other captives of war as slaves and move them all over the empire. And so some people are going to flee uh, Judea as a result of trying to escape the war. Some people are going to be moved around as prisoners of war by the Romans. But what it creates is something known as a diaspora. Jewish populations from uh, Judea, particularly Ju Jerusalem, are going to just be scattered all over the Roman world. And this is important. There's a real significance here. Pay attention because it's almost always on the final. The real significance of this, well, it's significant for a lot of reasons, but one of the significances, one of the reasons is important, is because in that population were small groups of people we've already just seen and talked about, Christians. And they're going to be spread across uh, the Roman world by this action, by the diaspora. And once they're spread across the Roman world, Christianity is going to go into an active phase of recruiting people who aren't Jewish, the Gentile mission, as it's sometimes known. And as a result, the religion is going to transform, its relationship with Rome is going to transform, and there's going to be a major political, social, and sociological shift that takes place in the Roman Empire. Okay, now, quick, quick rundown of some more of these emperors. I'm not going to get into details, but here you go. Titus and Domitian take over after Vespasian. Uh, Titus is going to rule for just a couple years and he's going to be assassinated and then Domitian goes bananas. He's super paranoid. He's afraid that what happened to his brother is going to happen to him too. And so he begins doing all the things that you pretty much guarantee that'll happen. He rounds up senators. He seizes their estates. He accuses everybody of treason and um, constantly is having people executed left and right. And the, the world descends into chaos. He is assassinated as well there's chaos civil war there's all this disorder and then a reprieve the five good emperors now the roman empire as an institution that we're all love and know and are familiar with might have died out at that point after domitian were it not for these guys nerva is the one who settles things down now, I've just put them up there kind of in one big lineup. We're not going to go through all of their individual lives and personalities. I'm just going to talk about them in general because they each sort of summarize a quality that Roman authors themselves are going to talk about as embodying a good ruler. They have things that, in many ways, Augustus pointed out as necessary to convince people that you're a good ruler, but are going to move from this point forward as kind of illustrations of how to do it right, how to uh, rule Rome the best way possible. And they all have qualities and embody those qualities that Romans like to see in their rulers. So quick, quick, 
Nerva. He's going to be the one who settles things down. He makes nice with the Senate. He does that extra mile to help them save face. He's respectful to them. He's the peacemaker. He takes all of their estates that have been seized wrongfully and restores them to the families and all that kind of jazz. People love him for that. He is merciful. He is the peacemaker. Then on top of that, you have Trajan. Trajan is the military victor. He's going to win uh, battle after battle after battle. He's going to expand the boundaries of Rome. He is going to put barbarians in their place. And this is something Romans value in an emperor. Next, you have Hadrian. Hadrian, I, I don't understand how he managed to do what he did. He was, <laughs> hard working doesn't even begin to cover it. He was a micromanager and he was micromanaging. I'll show you the map in a few slides. Uh, an empire that spanned basically an entire continent and then some. It was, I don't know how he ever slept, but he had detailed ideas about exactly how many bricks he wanted to go in the walls he was building. So he was, uh, he had a detail oriented guy, we should say. He also was militarily victorious, expanded the empire even further. Uh, building projects generally was an incredibly responsible, capable administrator. Antoninus Pius was a great patron He's going to hire people to write plays and poetry. He's going to hire people to make sculptures and art. He's going to hire people to do all kinds of things. And he is going to end up infusing money directly into the economy that way. All of these are qualities that a good emperor has to have. And you can see some of the effects of that in just a sec. This is Trajan's column. It's in Rome. You can see the scale of it just a bit because there's the column on the left. And then those little ditty dots are people. Um, and uh, you can see some cars in the parking lot. I just passed it there. Um, it's this massive, enormous column. And if you get close up, it is carved in this beautiful, incredible detail. And what it shows is all of the military victories that Trajan managed to carry out. All of the people he conquered, all of the cities he captured, all of the battles that he won. And so it's a great celebration of military victory because that is one thing the Romans love. Then you have Hadrian. Hadrian is a builder and he is a micromanager. I mentioned that he had strong opinions about how many bricks ought to go in walls he was building. Well, this is the wall in question. Uh, he builds something called Hadrian's Wall. And for many years, it sort of stumped historians because it's not terribly tall. It was taller in the Roman day uh, than it currently is because of the way the land is built up. But um, it uh, ranges uh, from about 6 to 15 feet tall. It was how tall it was originally. It had guard shacks kind of periodically along it. Uh, but as you can imagine, a stone wall, a brick wall that's six to 15 feet tall is probably not the best deterrent to attack that you could possibly imagine. This is not the Great Wall of China. It's built across kind of the narrowest point on the British Isles there that could sort of roughly, vaguely, not exactly uh, divide England and Scotland uh, from each other. And this was meant to mark the boundary of Roman territory, of Roman Britain. Uh, and it has a practical purpose as well. It's a potential practical purpose. It's probably how it was used. Not only did it mark the boundary, um, you didn't really need a whole wall for that, but there not only did it mark the boundary, but having a stone wall that was six to 15 feet tall probably didn't do anything to stop, uh, say, rampaging Scots from jumping over it if they wanted to and coming into Roman Britain. But it probably did stop what was a constant and chronic problem on the border. Cattle rustling. It was one of the ways that peoples tended to take advantage of the presence of a, uh, an imperially stocked Roman camp in their midst is that they did a bit of cattle thievery in the middle of the night in order to supplement their income. And a big stone wall might not very well stop people who wanted to cross it uh, in the middle of the night, but it probably does do a good job making it difficult to move cows from one side to another. All right. At any rate, it marks the border. It possibly stops cattle rustling. And most importantly, it creates jobs for those soldiers that are stationed way up at the back of beyond and need something to do to keep their mind off how cold and miserable they are. Okay. <laughs> and beyond that, we have the Pantheon. This is in Rome itself, and it's the great temple to all the gods. It was the kind of place where those uh, shrines would be set up to all of the gods of all of the places that Rome had encountered. 
and it has a beautiful coffered ceiling uh, with that ocula kind of on the top there uh, where the light comes in. And it's, a, it's an architectural marvel. And it's especially so because it highlights something that the Romans had innovated and were phenomenally good at using. That dome that you see there, uh, the wall, that wall of the, pa the Pantheon is created out of poured concrete, something that the Romans invent, and it allows them to build in ways that uh, people before them really couldn't. So that's just a piece of trivia, but going on. Okay, so these are the physical remnants of what Roman emperors, good Roman emperors should be doing, how they should be dedicating their time, what they should be able to accomplish. And then you have Marcus Aurelius, and he was very often held up by Roman historians who came after him as the model of the good emperor, as the arguably the best, most ideal emperor there was. He was the closest thing that Rome ever produced to somebody who you could call a philosopher king, like Plato posited would be the best ruler. He was a Stoic philosopher. Uh, he writes a book called The Meditations about his Stoic philosophy, and it's really lovely. You can read it. It's pretty cool, um, where he reflects on the responsibility of leadership and how if you want to be a leader that is successful, you have to put your own private concerns aside. You have to make sure that you discipline your emotions, that you don't react out of fear or anger or jealousy or any of the sort of human weaknesses that everybody suffers from. You have to do your best to get that under control, to always do what is logical and what is right so that you can do the best thing for the people that you rule and so he talks about rulership as service and he talks about the importance of the ruler to be fair to be honorable to be honest to be consistent and to be self-disciplined in every way it's a wonderful idea. He embodies all the other qualities that we've already mentioned. He was a military victor, expands the frontiers, probably to their greatest extent. He is uh, merciful to his defeated enemies. He is a great investor in arts and letters and building projects. He has got all of that stuff going for him. And this is what, oh, I'm sorry, this is what the empire looks like uh, while he's doing all of that. It is enormous. He's controlling everything around the Mediterranean, all through uh, Northern and Western Europe up to um, England. I'm sorry, the map cuts off before Hadrian's Wall, but picture it, it, it goes through England up to almost where Scotland is, around the Black Sea. It controls all of this territory. It's a massive undertaking to try to administer it all and to protect it along that frontier is just daunting. It's incredibly, incredibly difficult. Holding it together was always going to be a massive challenge, but it's one that is going to be met and failed by this guy. Marcus Aurelius's biggest failure, arguably speaking, he was great, a great emperor in every way, according to Roman sources, except rather than choosing, now this is something all the other five good emperors did, they didn't choose children to be their successors. Instead, they waited till they were adults and then adopted a competent, sane adult to inherit after them. Marcus Aurelius doesn't do that. He picks his son, Commodus, to come after him. And what happens when you raise a kid who anticipates that they'll be emperor? Just exactly what we saw with Caligula, just exactly what we saw with Nero. Uh, Commodus is unhinged. He's paranoid. He has weird delusions. He is not stable in any stretch of the imagination. He is just loony. And again, there have been lots and lots of modern uh, theories based on nothing. It's just hypothesis, I suppose, about why Roman emperors were so often crazy. And they usually point to the Julio-Claudians about this. And there's theories that they were lead poisoned. There's theories that they had some kind of inherited disease. There's theories that they had all kinds of issues. I personally am not convinced by any of that, partly because the genetic links aren't that strong, partly because uh, if they were affected, everybody would be affected and they're not. The five good emperors prove that. I think the most likely explanation is just what I've already talked about, that it's a deeply mind-bending phenomenon to be emperor. Nobody tells you the truth if they can help it. Everybody tries to manipulate you. Um, and the people you can trust the least are the people who are the people you traditionally would trust the most, your family. 
And so growing up in that environment where you're frightened all the time of everyone and their possible attempts on your life, when there really are being attempts on your life all the time, it twists and warps people. And it makes them very difficult to deal with as adults. And this is you see with Commodus as well. Commodus decides that he's, uh, he's missed his calling. He's not an artist. He's a gladiator. And this is problematic in Roman society because um, gladiators occupied this weird sort of paradoxical place. On the one hand, they're the closest thing in the ancient world had to sports heroes. That's kind of like how they were treated. I'll show you the picture. People knew their names, they had fan clubs, they had followings. But at the same time, they frequently came from the status of slave and they or from the underclasses. And they were considered people who had lost their dignity. They'd surrendered it. They are people who put their bodies literally on display and on the line for the entertainment of other people. And so they were considered to be pretty close to equivalent to prostitutes. That's all kind of the same thing. And so they weren't respected. They were beloved, but they weren't respected. And so for the emperor to masquerade as a gladiator, to dress himself up as Hercules, that's what that whole like lion skin he was wearing there a minute ago was all about and parade around in the arena. The crowd goes wild because this is just a, a thrillingly novel thing to see the emperor prancing around in the arena. But at the same time, it looks so embarrassing to the upper classes. They see the emperor behaving this way. It is a shock to the system and it's, considered to be shameful and then on top of that Commodus falls for the same kinds of mistakes that all those other emperors did uh, he's paranoid he has people killed his own family his extended family people are connected to them uh, senators who are powerful who might be plotting against him it just is a wreck and it just the, this political situation deteriorates it gets worse and worse and worse until he's assassinated in 192. And he's succeeded by Pertinax. Pertinax was the son of a freed slave. There really is social mobility in Rome. Uh, he's the son of a freed slave, and he ascends the throne uh, with the support of the army. The army backs him. Again, we're still in the era where the army's backing is the most important thing you can have. But now we've lost that collection of people who has a strong consensus in the army instead what happens is civil war it breaks down every commander every military commander has their troops proclaim them emperor and then they go to war against every other military commander in rome and it just turns into an almost constant low-level civil war going on all the time and every time that happens what happens to the economy is devastating rome's economy is based on farming and so if there's a civil war and armies are passing through town, stealing everything that isn't nailed down and commandeering everything that is worth anything and burning the rest so their enemies don't get hold of it. It ends up being devastating. People are going to be displaced off their land. They're going to end up having their crops stolen and lost. They're going to have all kinds of issues. Shipping uh, grain from one place to another becomes difficult. There's food shortages. It's really, really hard to live through, even if you're not in physical danger. And a lot of people are in physical danger from the civil wars that rage all over the place. It's a disaster and people hate it, but they can't see any way out of it. And as a result of this, uh, what happens is there's going to be a, a sort of a brief, I guess, there's going to be a, a, sorry, let me rephrase. There's going to be a time period where you have one military emperor, each kind of successively less popular and less fully in control over the empire after another. Uh, you're going to get the Severans, for instance. Um, they're significant in part because uh, their family is from North Africa. Um, but they are really just going to preside over a whole bunch of civil wars and it's going to be a mess. Sort of... This whole time period uh, in this, the 200s is referred to as the third century crisis from the assassination of Commodus forward. And that's like in 180. It is a disaster. You have civil war. And because they're not stupid, people who live outside the borders of the empire, the ones that were kept in check by the forces of the Roman army on the border or had been stationed, now look across and see that those armies are absent or they're busy with other things or that they're not really going, you know, they've got their own stuff going on. And because they're not stupid, people like 
the Germaniae and people like the, the Allens and people like um, the uh, Gepids are going to look across the border and be like, yeah, nobody's watching the store. Now is a great time to raid. And so there are all these incursions of people that Romans refer to as barbarians across the borders, grabbing up whatever they can and then dashing back across the border when any of those uh, generals turns their army against them to chase them down. And so that adds an extra wrinkle. If you want to be the emperor, you have to stop these people, but stopping these people distracts you from winning your civil war. And it just becomes difficult <laughs> then just to make matters even worse for these prospective emperors Persia's back uh there's going to be a new dynasty that rises in persia they claim to be descended from the original one the xerxes uh and the um, darius dynasty and they're going to rise to power and establish persia re-establish persia as a big regional empire again a rival to the power of rome at the same time you have civil war. At the same time, you have barbarian invasions. At the same time, economic collapse and crisis because the currency starts getting debased. Every one of these generals that wants to be emperor has to secure the support of the army. Well, what's the best way to secure the support of the army if you don't directly command them? Money. And so they start scrounging up as much coin as they possibly can to bribe uh, the soldiers. And the, when they run out, when they don't have enough to pay them, when they don't have enough to bribe them, uh, some of these bright lights decide, you know what we should do? We should remint coins. But instead of having them be, I don't know, 83% copper or 78% silver or whatever the alloy actually is. Let's just rework that so we use a little less of the precious metal and mix in a little bit more zinc or whatever. That way we can mint more coins and we can pay off more people and then it will work out great. Well, that sounds like a great and fantastic plan, debasing your currency, except that people aren't stupid. They get the new coins and they're like, this isn't the same at all. They do some minor and relatively easy investigation. They're like, this is not the same coin. This is ridiculous. This isn't worth the same. And then you add in all of the food shortages and, and material shortages of other goods and the difficulty of getting anything done and anything built and anything made. And the next thing you know, you have massive inflation. Everything costs a fortune. People don't have any money it's a crisis it's just a disaster from beginning to end and then making matters worse in 260 what you have is i mean during part of this process there's uh, so much civil war there's so much disorder you have a year where there are five emperors proclaimed by the senate which means they had enough uh, power over the army at any one given point that they could have themselves named emperor and have that approved uh, by the Senate in Rome itself. And then they die before they can do anything. One year, five emperors. And then in 260, what you get is uh, Valerian. The Emperor Valerian goes off to battle Shapur I, who is the uh, king of Persia, and he's captured in battle. That itself is pretty bad to have your emperor captured in battle, but it gets worse. Shapur grabs up Valerian, drags him back to the Persian capital, and then demands a ransom for him. Got the emperor, I want you to pay a ransom. The other people who are fighting for power in realm are like, nah, we don't care. We're not paying a ransom. So the emperor is captured, uh, held for ransom, and then just abandoned. They don't bother to ransom him at all. Shapur keeps him around for a while to abuse. And then when he gets bored with that, he has him executed, skinned, and has his skin put up to decorate the walls of his palace, which is pretty gross. But at any rate, that's what happens. This is how bad, this is how bad the situation is in realm. Emperors end up as emperor skin rugs. It is bad and it looks very much in the third century like rome is going down like this is the it this is the end they're going this they can't possibly survive but they do they manage to hang on even though and this is just a quick look at the map you have all of these um just terrible pressures you see all those arrows you don't have to remember it, what they are specifically those represent invasions of people across the borders causing all kinds of havoc creating all kinds of destruction and that's a really nasty thing for these would-be emperors to have to deal with when rome was expanding there's loot when you move into new territory and conquer it there's there's riches to be had out of that when people invade your country the best you can do is stop them and take your own stuff back. There's no profit in wars like that. Just cost. Just enormous, enormous monetary cost. So how does Rome survive? 
this guy, Diocletian. He's going to come to power. He's going to get control over enough of the army to settle things down. He is going to uh, take steps to try to fix the systemic problems he sees in Rome. And they're going to be pretty radical steps. First, he's going to divide the empire. Working on the theory that Rome is just too big. One person can't possibly rule the whole thing. He's going to split it in half. An eastern half and a western half. And he's going to have uh, an administration that acknowledges this division. Not only does he split the empire in half, an eastern half and a western half, he further divides those halves into smaller units known as dioceses. And that way, each of these dioceses will have an administration that is set up to make sure that the business of government gets done. He is going to, in fact, civilianize the entire Roman administration. Up until this point, the government of Rome had really been quite, quite tiny. You have an emperor, you have governors in the provinces. Those governors would be appointed with a skeleton crew. I mean, a handful of people. And then they would contract with the locals to do things like collect taxes and uh, oversee the courts and keep public order and all that kind of thing. Suppress piracy. And what Diocletian does is he attempts to professionalize this bureaucratic arrangement. He wants, instead of uh, governors who are often military or paramilitary in their, uh, I guess, origin, instead, he's like, there needs to be an actual civilian administration, people whose job it is to collect taxes, people whose job it is to administer the court system. And those people have to be permanent. They have to be people who are professionals, who come out of the civilian population. Uh, you can't just ask the army to do all your building for you and to do all of your law enforcement and to do all of your everything for you the way we have been because when the army is off fighting civil wars or defending the borders or causing all kinds of havoc then those things don't get done government falls apart too so Diocletian is going to dramatically expand the size of government more than quadruple it so you have permanent people who are, create stability by constantly having a civilian government that doesn't just up and leave every time the army goes off and does something else. Okay, he also, to create rulers for this system, comes up with a new institution. It's known as the Tetrarchy, or Rule of Four Men. Um, the statue more or less uh, represents it. The Tetrarchy works like this. It's a little bit odd from our perspective as modern people. There's an East and a West, and each of those is going to have two rulers. They're going to have a main emperor known as an Augustus, and they're going to have a junior emperor known as a Caesar. And this is meant to get rid of the succession crisis. Up until this point, whenever an emperor dies, there's a civil war to find out who's going to be the new emperor. Diocletian doesn't want that to happen anymore, so he's like, this is how it's going to work. If you're the emperor in the east, you appoint a Caesar in the east. And that person is like the junior emperor. You give them some tasks and some jobs and some stuff to oversee. They answer to you. You're technically in charge of the whole region, but they do a lot of work with you and for you. And they are an adult, competent person who's able to do this. When you die or retire, in the case of Diocletian himself, you step aside, the Caesar moves up and becomes Augustus, and they name a Caesar of their own. We'll have an Augustus in the east, an Augustus in the west, a Caesar in the east, a Caesar in the west. That way, when uh, the person is next up, we know smoothly who's going to take over. People will already be used to taking orders from them. They'll already be familiar. They already have the support of the army. This is going to solve our problems. That's the idea. So he creates this institution. It's a good idea. Uh, a little bit of spoiler alert. It's not going to work all that well. But, you know, it was a good thought. Then, and this is where we're going to break off today. Once he's done all of this, Diocletian looks into other things that he can stabilize. He finds out that you, the currency has been, he knows, the currency has been massively debased. So what he does is he collects all the coinage he can, smelts it all down, and restores it to its traditional levels of uh, precious metal. He fixes the currency. 
he then on top of that and he succeeds largely by the fact that he stops the civil war more than anything else he's going to try to set prices so that uh, people can't gouge uh, each other with the price of grain so he'll set price maximums on things so if there's a shortage of wheat say you can't just sell wheat for as much as you can possibly get for it you have to sell wheat at a set price uh, and first come first serve people are going to buy it and that way poor people have some chance of still being able to eat that's the idea he's also going to pass a whole bunch of other rules that are all designed on keeping people where they are he it makes it the law and this was the custom but he makes it the law that whatever your father does for a living you have to do that too if you're a man that's your job and so no people moving around looking for different opportunities no stay where you are do your father's job especially bakers he makes it illegal for bakers to abandon their position and leave town and of course the reason bakers might want to do this if there's a gr grain shortage is that they can't sell bread for the price it costs them to produce it and if they're standing there in front of a bunch of angry hungry people telling them it's ten dollars a loaf of bread they're going to get killed so diocletian attempts to solve this problem by simply telling bakers that if they flee their post they'll be killed so i don't know there you have it um but uh he makes all these efforts to try to create stability and to return rome to a more uh, i guess traditional way of life now this is where he's going to run into his major obstacle Once Diocletian starts poking around, finding out what the problems are and attempting to turn Rome into its traditional way of life, what he finds out, to his shock and horror, and we'll talk about this in detail next time, is that that weird group of sort of Jews uh, that Roman emperors had more or less been ignoring up until this point, the Christians, have spread all over the empire. The third century, with its disaster and crisis, was actually a brilliant uh, environment, a perfect growth medium for the Christian cult, which we'll explain why next time has expanded tremendously particularly in cities all over the roman world and diocletian does a little investigation he's horrified to find this out the reason he's horrified we'll talk about a bit next time he's horrified to find this out and he's like there are christians how many and his investigation reveals that there's tons of them they're all over the place and so he flips he's like this cannot be allowed to happen we need tradition we need a return to the ways of our ancestors and so he orders christianity to be eliminated and we're going to talk about how that all plays out next time thanks a bunch and i'll see you then <laughs>